before you say anything, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> are you ready? Are oh. you ready? Are you ready? So we another love, cheerful show. We love taking on <laughs> these very cheerful subjects. Something about like the raw, real life is part of what I've always wanted on the show. I have not wanted a polished five ways to be successful, how to build your online funnel. Like there's enough of that in the world. Seven steps for happiness. Yeah, I didn't want to do that with our show. I wanted us to be with people in really hard times and just discuss what it means to be alive, what we've learned from some of the challenges and the peaks. It shouldn't only be one side. And today and Ian, yesterday, Ian, Hale. Hale. If you say it quickly, of course, it becomes inhale, inhale, which I love. Drives him crazy when I say it. Took us many years. He's like, Andy, it's not the first time I've heard that. We're going to be talking to Ian Hale about his life at the moment because there's a lot going on, including something in his past life, which was a challenge where he actually tried to commit suicide. And we're going to do that on a wonderful chaos till we see you soon. Are you going to say anything, Bambos, or do I have to carry the full intro today? Man. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> oh, I have to press the damn button. <laughs> Again. <laughs> So the, I the shit that goes on during the intro. I I wrote Ian because Ian, his life at the moment, the last thing I would suggest for this individual is for them to come on a podcast. Just for reference. So Ian buried his mom yesterday. And even as I hear myself and the words come out of my mouth, I feel like I could cry just feeling into what that mean and meant to me in my own life. So he married his mom, he buried his mom yesterday and, and his wife is currently very ill and to the point where, you know, with life threatening things going on in her system. So he's really it. Like, I would just want to say like a, a, a uh, he's holding a lot, a fragile moment in his life. So, uh, so for him to come on the show says a lot for me, like the fact that he's like willing to be vulnerable with us at a moment like this is just beyond me. I don't, I don't know if I could do it. It would just be, it would be carrying too much at one moment for me, I would think. Yeah. 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 And, and the story, when I, I talked to him, you know, it's always funny because there's a lot of people in my life and I always will, will talk to him and then Ian, I'll call up every two to three months and just see how he is. And he, and, I, and he said, Andy, well, I, you know, I think we said, I, I'd love to have you on a show. And then, and he, Ian has, uh, he's been doing leadership training for years. He's, he's sort of in the circuit. He's well known. He's worked at all the big businesses in the world. So in my mind is like, yeah, Ian, we're not that kind of show. Ian, I'd love to have you on, but I'm not looking for a leadership show. Is there like I, I get into the raw, real topics and then and then he just throws out like a, the curveball at me. And he says, well, Andy, I try to commit suicide. I, I'd be willing to talk about that. And then like kind of like I, it, it threw me back on myself because in a way I was like, wow, that's what I'm looking for. But I would never ask for it. Mm. And when he said that, I do realize that, as you know, from your own life, there's a suffering so deep that people don't realize that there's so many of us with that suffering and it can even lead as far as suicide. Yeah. And I thought, what an incredible opportunity just to be present with it, hear what's going on in his life. That was my intro for today. Thank you. Anything come up for you? Oh, shitloads. <laughs> Anything you'd like to share? Um... I mean, it, it, it was it wasn't so. I mean, I actively try to kill myself between the age of fifteen and twenty five, mm -hmm. and it crossed my mind in the two years of COVID when I lost so much business, I was going down the drain. Yeah. So uh, for me, e even entertaining and allowing the thought to be there. Yeah. Uh, 
it's heavy shit. And what I what I see happening in my body, I already feel a contraction in my heart. Yeah, yeah. Even uh, if I start to talk about it. Mm. And as you, as you know, because I mentioned several times, breath work saved my life. Yeah. So as we go through the show, you be present with what's going on. Yeah. Meaning whatever you can do what, or break in or tell me what you need. That's the point. Sure. Yeah. I, like there's nothing. I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, I got that. I just want to let you know at least that you're welcome to take this in any direction if it doesn't serve you as well. Yeah. Hello, Ian. Thanks hey, for Ian. being with us given the uh, What the hell? Circumstances. W w like, do you have like a razor blade box where you just like, <laughs> like, let me like torture myself by being mm -hmm. vulnerable at a moment, which is pretty, I can't imagine it not being pretty intense for you right now. Mm. Well, thanks for that introduction. And thanks for noticing and saying that. Um, th there was something else you missed out, actually. It was my best friend. We've been friends since we were 16. So that's uh, some 43 years. He had a heart attack the same week as all this happened. So nah. got my best friend in a heart attack can't make the funeral of your mum. Uh, there was there's a lot been going on and what I've noticed you both mentioned vulnerability and that experience of vulnerability is that last week when I was going into shops and people asked me how I was there are shops where I was known or not known I just went hey my mum died and it was an extraordinary reaction from the people who were just straight there with me not like awkward not all terribly British and upset about it, but just, wow, I'm so sorry to hear that. Steve, who I've known, runs the uh, Cobblers. <laughs> That's the shoe menders. He's, um, he, he just launched straight how sorry he was. He's seen her with me sometimes. And it's, that was just being received that way. One store I went into, uh, the ice cream shop, was giving myself a treat. And he said, how are you? And I'm, yeah, I'm just good. How are you? And then I looked and thought, well, I'm good, except this thing happened. And then immediately we're into another conversation. I'm fortunate to live in an area where it's not illegal to talk about things that are emotional. You can, can at wow. least address them in this part of England. It's quite liberal and top this here. The support of family and friends, just an un overwhelming amount of people rooting for me, for us at the moment. And I'm more moved by the care and love shown for me I was trying to compare it to, but I can't. Just, I'm moved by it, totally moved by love and the presence of that. Yeah. When you're at the shop, do you share with the person what happened or do you just sit with it when you're in front of, they say, how are you? And you say, okay, do you, do they know that your mom died? And if they don't, would you ever say that? Oh yeah, no, that's my point. I tell them my mom died. I'm wow. not afraid to say that. That's just straight to, yeah, my mom died. There's no other way. There's, there's no other way to address that. I'm, I'm rarely interested in when someone says, how are you? Just, I'm fine, how are you? Or I, oh, yeah. okay. In, in Devon, when we first here, moved here years ago, it was, all right, all right, would be your reply. It's just like, yeah, I'm all right, you're right. Which yeah. is a huge level of affection, everything meant in there. I, I'm not sure as a Brit that we normally expect people to tell us how we are, but I yeah. will unabashed best because I want to know how you are. It's like I equally want to know how you are. So I'm right. going to answer you honestly, and then you can gauge your response. And it's okay if you want to, oh, I'm, that's, you know, if it's, you know, if you want to say, oh, that's a shame, I, I still need to talk to you about this. That's okay as well, but you know where I'm at. There's something really vulnerable. Um, I, I've, I've lived in England and kind of, encountering someone and sharing my mom just died and not knowing if they can even hold that space mm. like and if someone can't hold that space it gets awkward and all of a sudden you need to caretake them or not yeah like mm -hmm. I, I i always feel the the balance in that mm. Mm. but it's it's always beautiful just to surrender to it and let yeah, them it is a kind of surrender bambos and actually i'm just realizing the expression i use is my mummy died I talk uh, as my six-year-old self. <laughs> yeah. I think I talk as my six-year-old self. Yeah. Yeah. I rem remembered when m I was told that my dad died. It was like three in the morning and I got calls. Like I had one rule to my family. I remember you told this once. 
The rule was if somebody dies, don't call me until the morning. Like mm -hmm. call me at six or seven. Don't call mm -hmm. me in the middle of the night. Like that was like the rule because mm -hmm. I want to sleep and they're, they're dead. They're <laughs> dead. Nothing's going to change between yeah. the time I'm. And, yeah. and of course, no one follows that rule. So <laughs> they call me at two in the morning, two thirty, three. Mm -hmm. the phone keeps. Ringing. And now at the point that the third time it rings in the middle of the night, now I'm getting nervous because I'm mm -hmm. like, someone's trying to call me. So I pick up and then and then my brother calls and says, you know, dad died. And I uh, I shut down emotionally, so I couldn't mm. feel the emotion. And then Ronnie began to cry. Mm. And when she cried, that sort of was the first time I could kind of feel my own emotion through her tears. Mm. And then I booked a plane in that that but in the next two hours and I went to the airport and then and then uh, fuh, yeah. when I went to the airport, I went to the line. And the woman who was servicing at the counter, I knew. And uh, right, and then right. So I'm, I'm looking in the eyes of someone I now know, mm. and uh, and and she could see the ticket was booked three or hours earlier. So she asked me, you know, what, why, what's going on? Or or she was just she was curious and loving. And then I just said, my dad died, and then I lost it at the counter. Because it was like the first time I had I said it out loud, where I could hear the words back in my own ears and saw mm -hmm. how real it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, the, yeah. I I think for me, I, you know, I, I've encountered death a few times. I was on a train ride mm -hmm. uh, back from London to Devon when I got news that my one of my very close friends. Um, um, uh, one moment. Right, somebody asking me if you're I not, you're not just doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they were asking it. me if I was in the podcast. Ian, I said, Yeah, you're here. Ian, yeah, one yeah, second. Yes, we gotta get some things done, <laughs> and we gotta get through business here as well. Come on, no, not business. They said they, I told somebody yeah, that I, know, I was I gonna be on the curse, and they said, Oh, I love that podcast. Look, there's a fan, Heidi. Uh, Heidi loves it, so I've told her I'm on there. I love um, it. So, uh, and I was on this train, and and I my my friend had died. Ted. He was like this wrong word. Might mentor be wrong word, but at about the time we're about to talk about about my uh, suicide attempt and my experience of deep depression, Ted was one of my saviors at the time. There were about about three older men who were just brilliant with me, and Ted was one of those. And he died, and I just started to cry on the train. And my neighbor across the, the seat looked up and said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, my friend died. Can I tell you about him? Because that's all I wanted to do was wanted to talk about this man. I didn't want to leave that. I didn't want to leave Ted hanging, if you like, in that moment. Mm. Um, so I don't think I'm afraid of it. I, I claim I'm not afraid of dying. I, I And it's not going <laughs> to, yeah, we'll come to that about maybe when I was afraid. But um, I, I don't think I'm uh, too afraid of it for myself. It's real seeing things die you know every day um yeah yeah mm. yeah so it's kind of our birthright to die and funny <laughs> enough i didn't know what the podcast would be today i forgot about it and this morning i had a call with my mother and she had like little complaints and she was going on and on and you know our relationship is really beautiful and we've I've made a lot of peace with her and at some point i told her mom none of this will matter when we die. Mm. And she's like, do you really have to say that now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, don't use those weapons and, on me. And, and, and yeah, of, don't pull out the death <laughs> card. And I kind yeah. of shared with her, like, uh, there's been a few individuals in my life recently who also died. And mm. sometimes a picture was sent to me and I could see the person's eyes being at peace. And mm. I just told her, I think when the moment comes, we just let go. Like, mm -hmm. like, there's nothing to hold on to it. It feels like it's just the most natural thing to do is let go. Mm. Yeah, I can't. Um, and that's what I spent my the last the week before mum died telling her, just preparing her and talking to her that it was time. I read her stuff. It was about letting go and preparing her to make that journey. There's three things I've learned from my mum, right, for, as she passed, right? There's three things that I've been left with. One is... Um, without a doubt, let your loved ones know how you want to die. Mm. She, she had heavy dementia. And I looked at my boys as I did her eulogy yesterday, I looked across them and said, 
this is a conversation we're due to have. I've told Morgan already that, you know, in a jokey manner, let me off the edge of the cliff on my wheelchair, if that's what I'm in. But actually, there's a more serious conversation. I do not want to see myself traduced, reduced in the way that mum was in that way. And I, that's, a, that's a, another conversation, another podcast maybe. But um, the second part was... I have got these beautiful pictures of her in her youth from a, a four month, a four year old child to a very gawky teenager. And then in this blossoming, there's one shot of her in the bath. Uh, and that's, that's going to sound odd now, but it's one shot in like 1950s starlet with the, she wasn't that, but covered with foam, just her head. It's beautiful. And what I saw is that mum's life changed at some point after she got married to this glamorous life my brother tells me about. They broke down in the jag and the, my brother's sister and I think our nanny was in the car. Mum was in a mink coat and this Rolls Royce comes past and they just whisper into the Rolls Royce and someone clearly dealt with the car. At a later stage, it was like it was dealt with. So we lived this glamorous life and, you know, we used to go and get our suits uh, cut at Harrods and it was just this very privileged lifestyle we had. And um, then... Um, Something must have changed for her. Some of the pressures of life, whatever came in on her, and uh, perhaps even Valium at some point was very popular in the 70s. And she became more concerned with what other people thought and how you, how it, what was proper. And mm. um, so the second piece for me is just being um, like daring with your life, like that risk. Kierkegaard's to dare is to, to, not to dare is to lose one's uh, self or one's footing. To dare is to momentarily lose one's footing. Mm. And I love that idea. And I wish she had lived into that beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, drawer of Strauss woman. And the final thing is, as, um, is I wouldn't be here without her. So for those mm. petty things that uh, Bambos was just doing, those little minor infringements, I, I'm really, I'm complete with my mum. We had all the conversations I needed to have about is there anything left unsaid? Mm. And I know that would evoke a lot with you over there, Andy. I'm fortunate to have caught that uh, 21 years ago and I called her up and afterwards when she came around to the house and she knew that I loved her, she said that was the most important telephone call of her life. Yeah. So to know that I had nothing unsaid with her and that we'd spoken about everything that needed to be dealt with, there was this space between us. And um, I would not be here without her and without dad. And I'm privileged to be here and I'm privileged to have my children because of them. So there's nothing else mm. to say. Um, yeah, about that. That's, so that's why I can be here, I think, today mm. uh, with love and respect for my mum's life mm. and yeah, those three points. The the daring life thing hit me very strong, weirdly, because I I don't see it as separate from also feelings of suicide. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and and the reason that I say that is because in a way I've often seen when I've dared myself to do things, mm -hmm. I've had to le let parts of my identity die mm -hmm. because it was so uncomfortable to do what I was going to do and not knowing what it would be. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I'm, I'm just wondering how it is, because there is an aspect of that. Like in the, in the, the last letter, I, I even wrote that I was so depressed that I decided I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to kill the idea of whoever the hell I am now, because if I continue mm. at this rate, it's, life is over anyways. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, so I can get that completely. Andy. I wish I'd known that um, in 93, 94, that, you know, that fatal year when I experienced what I experienced. I would, you know... I wouldn't, I, no regrets. I wouldn't change it. You know, I could talk you through how I'd re-steer my life. And in Matthew, is it Matthew Hayes, the Midnight Library, he talks about, uh, the, you know, going back and changing and trying another life and putting another book on the shelf. I, um, I, I think this one has taught me so much, even that really painful period. And uh, my emails, and you will have read them, my quote is that Apollinaire quote, come to the edge, he said, and they said, he said, they said they're afraid, come to the edge, he said, and they came and he pushed them and they flew. And the shortcut, that's the same as Kierkegaard, the shortcut for my life is come to the edge. So I quite like the edge. I quite like peering into the chaos and the abyss. And I've been there, which makes it easier. And I think it helps me in my work as a coach that I know what the abyss looks like. So you can't get 
much past me in that domain because yeah. I'll meet you there. And I think yeah. that's what we need. It's like meeting you two who have been through your own journey. Therefore, this is comfortable. So why would I be uncomfortable having a conversation, however vulnerable it might be? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because the, the, what I would say is, is if you're living on the edge of what it means to be alive, the intensity is not associated with negative anymore. It's associated with being alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I think that that's hard for people to grasp because when you don't associate that feeling of the intensity of just the pure, you know, when, when someone said someone was once judging me for crying, like mm -hmm. as if that was, and I was like, if I don't cry once a day, then I don't feel like I'm touching the beauty of what it mm -hmm. means to be alive. Mm -hmm. So how can you, it was, so if you associate that tears with a negative, I sorry for that life that doesn't have the opportunity to have that experience as well. Mm. Yeah. My mother told me once, because I, I, didn't enjoy the experience of going back to school, boarding school each mm -hmm. term. She told me once, I said this to my brother just the other day, We were, sat, I think it was when we were sat at the, her coffin, my sister didn't want to come and see mum, but Nigel did, and he said, oh, I'm afraid to touch her, and, I, and I'd kissed her and I'd held her hand. And um, uh, what I said to him, I said, mum said to me, I could feel him holding himself back, and I said, mum said to me once, that you had said that you admired my courage in being able to display my emotions about going back to school. He was the elder brother, the responsible one, so held himself back. And I bless him for saying that to her then, right? Bless her for telling me, because <laughs> mm. it gave me some freedom. And um, yeah, I'm not afraid of my vulnerability. I think it does make it stronger. I, 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 I think it is one of the most powerful things that we have um yeah, yeah. The ways mm. of being we have is our vulnerability so mm. yeah and i have gen grandchildren to be responsible for right to make sure that they uh can be present to it so you know we're less inclined to uh, to uh to fuss over them if they fall and hurt themselves to crying it's like oh you hurt yourself well, let's get up and not get up and face it just uh, just it's <laughs> They allow them to be with their pain, but they don't necessarily need soothing and want them to learn. It's all about, oh, let's wrap you up because your tears are there. Mm. Um, I've got a question actually for both of you, because I, I, as I mentioned, had my own experience, but I never actually tried to kill myself. Mm. How, how does it feel the day afterwards? Mm. I can answer that if, if, yeah. if you're uh, happy for me to go first, man boss. Um, the first thing, the most offensive thing about it is what short shrift the hospital staff gave me when they when I was in this. They were just like, they foolish man. And that's like, you would think, oh, no, hang on. Oh, poor you. No way. <laughs> they were like, you foolish man. You, and I don't think they said stupid, but they were not afraid to, you know, I can imagine the catalog is, yeah, you're wasting our time. This is a bed somewhere we could have been healing someone. What are you doing here, right? Yeah. Um, the the let me just pull right back into that moment because i do remember that and then a bit of forl forlornness like what now like okay what am i supposed to do um and it's taken me a long time to learn that that is a cry for help really right <laughs> really is it's like if only i'd spoken up sooner Right, I, if only I'd spoken. But I, it's amazing how resilient your resistance is. <laughs> I don't know what that statement even means, but my unwillingness. I have a, I have a winning formula of being secretive. I have one, one of being charming and friendly. And my other one's being secretive. I'll keep stuff wrapped up as tight as I can. And Ellie will call it like the nutshell she has to break. And I will not let you in there if I can help it. And yeah, I'm willing to be vulnerable. There's such a contradiction. So yeah, yeah, that I think like. The feeling of, ah, oh, okay, the only route out of this is always to talk. And I have those conversations myself now. You talk about it day afterwards. I still go, hmm, well, how do I get out of this by talking about it? Surely it makes it worse. So, yeah, the, the, the surprise from the hospital staff that, that how they treated me back. The, the, the what now question, which somehow had already been, the door had been reopened, the choice to be amongst the living and 
a subtle and slow recognition that it didn't solve anything. It was probably it's really careful how I said say this. I know because I've researched and spoken to people now that work with suicide that if they've decided if if pretty much if they have decided, then you're not going to get them to come back this way anyway. If they probably, yeah. but so there's no convincing them. But um, yeah, I'm not. I lost train of my thoughts. So I'll yeah, pause yeah, yeah. there and let, and let Pambos uh, speak. Maybe maybe he has a. I'd love to hear your experience actually. Mm. Uh, I I think when I look back, when I was a teenager, and when I even entertained the thought in the last two years, it was a different experience. Um, when I was a teenager, I was a drug addict. So in a way, I, I was numbing myself. And after the five suicide attempts, it it didn't, I felt, it, oh, I'm not dying. Like I'm doing all these things to hurt myself, but I'm not dying. And mm -hmm. um, it was only after staying stuck in a kind of uh, trip for a couple of months where I was almost losing my, like the ground from under my feet, where I felt, fuck, I'm continuing all the bullying and all the abusive I had onto myself. And in that moment, I just saw, wow, I can't do this anymore. Something needs to change. And I wouldn't say when I had these thoughts, I had common sense, but I was very naive. Mm -hmm. um, it took me a long time to actually sentences in this way. And uh, a few months ago when I, when I had an empty bank account and I just didn't want to be a burden in anyone's life. And I saw that I like, what do I do? Like I'm, I'm losing it. And I felt that everything I was doing was uh, coming from fear. Mm. And I looked at my phone, I was scrolling down. I don't want to call this person. I don't want to call this person. So, and I couldn't find the name on the phone to call. And I thought, do I call the doctor? They're going to give me medication. There was nothing outside of myself to help me. And mm -hmm. I, I sat down and breathed for a hundred minutes. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing I could do to hold on to something let's say and i didn't even know it was going to help but after the 100 minutes more space and through the space i i had more um uh introspective over the what was happening mm -hmm. so i was in it and then i was looking at it um, yeah what you just triggered in me is this thought <laughs> thought or memory that i I know I still have that choice, right? <laughs> Bizarrely, right? I don't want to. This certainly, you know, no, 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 not condoning suicide at all. But do you know what? I have that choice still. If I, you know, I, I want to know I've got that choice when I'm eighty, fucked with dementia, and can say it's my consent to kill myself to let myself go. That's important. But I do have suicide thoughts. So I sometimes do that. It's interesting. Often for me, Bambos, about money it could be you know money or concern for the future bizarrely and then i'm i'm straight there i'm like oh right okay well that would... then i think i heard on the radio even the insurance policies are invalidated and i thought oh now i'm buggered so what <laughs> it's like all those they're random and fast thoughts but actually that I, I noticed they can be there now i'm not saying that makes me depressive at the time like if i go back cast my mind back is i couldn't and it was this funny enough a silly thing we'd argued over a tape in the house that uh, a vhs tape and um ellie was must was putting up with so much from me at that time like life must have been so hard with two children when i'd had my car accident in 1990 barney uh, morgan was three and barney was six months old mm. and then your husband gets in a car crash and is not able to really care for himself and then is in recovery and then slowly slides into depression. It must have been, looked really messy to her and it did, right? And there was stories for another day. However, at that point that we hit, there's this moment when <laughs> it's so funny when I think about it, it's a VHS tape. On it, it says adults tape. And we're both looking at the, who does this belong to, right? 
like and both consuming it must be some porn or something on there because why else would it say adult state by the way it turns out it belonged to some neighbors who had lent us uh, a series called wed draw for comedy but and it was so the kid their kids wouldn't tape over it so it said adult state but to us and I was not mine. And she said, well, it's not mine. It must be yours. And we like, and I threw it across the room. I was so angry as I had been in my depression at that time, mm. not knowing how what my future looked like from this car accident. And then she said that, and I said this, right? That's an argument for you, right? And then I said, right, that's it. I, don't, I grabbed the, my whiskey bottle. I went and got all the tablets I could find um, and started to walk down the road with them. Mm. It, it, five steps, swig, five steps, tablet, five steps, swig. Five, I don't know how far I walked and came to a telephone box and it looked like the warmest place to die. It was, you know, our telephone boxes in the country, mm. nicely lit. And so I went there and um, wanted to say goodbye to my sister. Mm. And I called her up. Now, psychologists, the analysts could have all their stories about what I was doing in that moment. But out of all those people, no thoughts of my children at that time of what their future would look like without their dad or how it would impact them. No thoughts for Ellie. She was the perpetrator. So fuck her at that mm. moment. Yeah. And my sister, though, who had been my avid supporter, laughed at my jokes visited me at school just this was, was my big sister i had to talk to her and um i called her up and started she kept talking to me and i knew that in the background she was trying to work out where i was with her husband and tell him to tell ellie and i didn't want to stop her doing that because i could feel her love for me in that moment i did want her to let me go i just wanted to say you you know i'm just i'm sorry but i'm going yeah and i can feel myself as i tell you that it's literally you know if you're going to make a movie of it sliding down with my back sliding against the window of the telephone box and the and the cord of course barely reaches so i've got it mm. pulled here trying right? my voice disappear. I can feel the bliss of the alcohol and the bliss of the drugs taking hold and just um being in that inner that space of I didn't I could no I didn't have to be responsible for anything. It's the only way I could frame it for you. Mm. I no longer was responsible. I was let oh let <laughs> that letting go. I was now I was I was letting go of everything. Yeah. Um and the little nugget in there, that little bit that is unbreakable was fighting wanting to fight back, but had, had at that stage been defeated and quieted down. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> when you said that those words, letting go of everything, I always feel in my life today, if I don't feel at peace with letting go of everything at any moment, then I feel like uh, disassociated, disconnected, mm -hmm. uh, un uh, ungrounded or uncentered. And, and of course, it gets harder the more mm -hmm. those things become Ronnie or the more those things come. So I feel that I would never be able to make peace with that. I'd have to mourn the loss of it. But if it's a house or a car or like, like I, I don't attach much to the, uh, things outside of me in those regards. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's interesting when you said let go of everything, it's almost like I would almost say the, the key to the happy life is what you felt in that moment without needing the whiskey and the drugs <laughs> for it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely agree with you. I, right. I, you know, Ellie, I was worrying about something the other, other day and Ellie says you just get to, um, you know, we've always been looked after. I mean, literally, uh, and I could feel that resistance right that i can feel it pushing against me going she's right about that that you know literally it it'll be okay and going and going to myself wow 
But that would mean I'd have to let go of everything, right? Which I know, and 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 feeling that that the, there was the void right in front of me. No, I can't go across there, right? And and yet because because I could hear the trap going. Yeah, but you've never done that. And what's been successful in by not letting go of, by not letting go of everything, right? You have never had to let go. You've never had to trust to it. Also, don't do that now. It's like it's crazy thought, and every time. They're unattached. Be it returning a. Oh, we were playing. Uh, we were playing cards last night. The family when we came home. We're quite mm. aggressive. Uh, aggressive card players and game players. I right? love our games, and we've got a particular game of which there should be a book of rules through. And I know every single rule about them because it's all made up and added to over the years, right? Yeah. And uh, at some point, uh, so one of the kids, or I think one of the girlfriends or partners, went. It is just a game, I, and I think I was in, I was in such a raw, vulnerable, slightly drunk, slightly stone state. I just went, wow! I have just got for the first time ever. This is just a game as well because I played them so seriously. I just this is just a game, and I, and I kept teasing them. I kept going, yeah, it's just a game. <laughs> Still determined to and now using it's just a game as a strategy to win at the same time. Yeah. It is just a game, right? And the mo I so to what you just said, the day I get that life is just a game, right? There is something and nothing and nothing and it's just a game, then I can win at it, right? If there's anything to yeah. win, you know, I'm I'm gonna have that happiness you uh, you talk about because it's definitely mm. not in the things and the money and everything else. No. It's yeah. been this last week, particularly in the love of others. Yeah. I, I always had a theory, Andy and Ian, when I, like, when I go out in the world and I'm just walking on the streets and I'm, if I slow myself down and I breathe and I, re, like, everything slows down and I look, and I even stop to look at people around me mm. and... <laughs> I can see, or I'm, I'm what I'm sensing, and uh, I'm saying this out loud because it's it's also a really big projection that I'm putting out there. But the way our society is today, I I, I see there's a disconnect mm. from self, or a lot a lot of a lot of the time that we might be having a connection with ourselves is used up in ways which might be not nourishing us or serving us as much. Uh, being on our phones or work that doesn't serve us. And uh, even my a client that I just spoke to on the phone, she says, it's Friday. <laughs> we, and, you know, she's going to go out and drink this weekend. So, and I'm like, fuck, as I'm hearing you speak, I'm like, how many people actually might even have suicidal thoughts, but don't let it in and they kind of suppress it just by um drinking or let's go watch a movie and then we're gonna eat a pizza and then we're gonna do this so there's a lot of activity and there's not so much time to actually sit down and feel quote monstrosity of life hmm. yeah i think stopping and looking at others like we oh people have got it worse. <laughs> People have got it worse off than you does nothing for anyone, right? It's just yeah, like, oh, yeah. yeah, fuck them, fuck them then, right? That's their problem, right? Immediately. Uh, the way I try and explain that when I'm working with people and not making this about work, but I say to what's your worst feature on your body? And people go, that's an odd question, very personal. They'll even do it in group coaching. And someone will say their nose or their, oh, I don't like my big feet or my breast or my belly or whatever. And I go, okay, yeah, mine's my nose. And I lived for years with that. Now, I'm just, if I said my nose looks off, you know, I don't like my nose, most people's inclination, oh, your nose is all right, okay? And for a moment, it is. And then, then, then I get back to the camera, the mirror. Oh my God, my nose is back. Where did that? All right. And I think us. I think we. I think what you just described, Bambus, is us doing that to ourselves, trying to solve it through something else or appeasing it. No, you have to be with it, right? Because you ain't going to get any other, unless you get them altered. And I know someone was talking to me about having her breasts altered a few years ago, and she said it's one of her regrets. She probably wants them put back as they were because we mm. all know that's not it I, I don't know i can't tell you that but mm. so that idea that trying to alter anything for the set, just being with as it is and as it isn't and loving people that way as well is yeah. all of those so look out in the world and go 
that person is dealing with their stuff just like I am, that person. And you can bring your compassion that way. No other way you can bring compassion to people without just looking at them. Just They're just like me and you, I guess. The well, I, I guess I made the, the story also as a, as a means of I think suicide is is or the potential of ending life is there for everyone and to what degree is it allowed to be there? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a my my I, my friend um, Colin has been gone a long time, committed suicide, um, and. You know, he's the guy uh, my brother and I shared a house with years ago. And then two years ago, uh, two uh, uh, classmate of one of my sons, Barney, committed suicide. And, um, you know, apparently on the outside was thriving and looked okay. And then inside like others. And then the son of an, uh, another friend of ours who... Uh, committed suicide it's going on all the time um i think it, what i notice it returns me to yeah that i'm sure there are people so i think there's some people who just don't even entertain the thought for themselves other people and that there that doesn't make them right or wrong it's just other people no different than you like your hair one way and someone else likes it another i think it's just the luck of our draw and our circumstances what i do know is um i don't think you should I don't want anyone to commit suicide because I don't want anyone to commit suicide, full stop. And by the way, to commit suicide, this I learned only recently, it's called that because it was illegal. So you commit murder or you commit a crime or a robbery, you don't commit suicide because it's not it's not a criminal act. Well, it's not here anymore, criminal activity which seems the most, I put it up there with shooting people who fell asleep on sentry duty to teach them a lesson or teach the, or the Romans would do the same thing. I'm like, really? Right, really? I, how encouraging is that, really? But honestly, to to then prosecute someone for having attempted it in the first place mm. seemed nutty. So even removing that word, right, right you, we have our choice and you've no right to take that choice away from me and I'm not condoning the taking of one's yeah. own life. Yeah, just, I had yeah. we had a show which I I it's an individual who has also tried to commit suicide a few times, and they said I have the right to take my own life, and mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't arranged that show for us yet. But it's one of those moments where it's one of those shows where it's yeah how how is it that society defines whether we are or not able to take our own life? Because in a weird way, isn't it our prerogative on our terms? Like you mentioned, and this was a movie that I saw two nights ago, which was one of the most powerful movies I've seen in a very long time, a British film. I think it was called Stardust or Star Something. I don't know if you know of it or not. Painful. Uh, keep going. Painful movie to watch. Two, two, uh, a, gay, a gay couple, uh, one of them has dementia and they're taking their last road trip together. And the one with dementia has decided to, to commit suicide at a moment when the other is going to be away. And then the other, of course, discovers that he has that intention. And it's the beautiful moment where he, the, the one with dementia, is deciding how he wants his life to end. And the loving partner not being able to say goodbye and having to deal with the fact that if he really loves him, then he'll allow him mm. to go out the way he wants to go out. But even talking about it makes me want to cry because it's just mm. an incredible moment. Is that surrendering to the love of the person to say, even though I don't want to say goodbye to you, I know that's how you want to go. Mm. And, and, it, mm. it de and it dealt with the complexity of that moment in a way that was just simple, not, not Hollywood-esque, a pure portrayal of the difficulties of either side of it. Mm. Yeah. I think it, I, I mean, I felt that when I first said goodbye to my son, his first day of school, it felt like a, there was a death going on in that moment, right? There was a passing of something. So I, what, why that came up as you were saying that was like the permission for the others. That was me doing that to, with all the attachment I had to schooling, right? And, and then my mm. other son clinging 
to us in the kindergarten, but it was an easier place to leave him. Uh, and we, we just took our time. It was okay. But that, um, yeah, that, um, see, what I saw with my mum, this is why I'm an advocate of being able to choose, make our choices. She, they called me. I couldn't have been in almost more idyllic situation. I'd flown to Mozambique, was then catching a little plane out of Maputo to go onto this little tropical island with about a tiny little village and then just us, which is going to be 16 executives. And uh, Elliot was coming on the next trip with me, but on this trip I was with a colleague who got seasick. We, we were due to sail on these two boats, but he and I flew because he got seasick as apparently did some of his colleagues. Um, but anyway, we got there and um, the phone rings and it's Ellie to say, your mum's in hospital. The, the doctor, they need you to give permission as head power of attorney to operate. And then in the meantime, I'm managing the show from, okay, you need to call the kids here, let them know so they can have their last words with her, right, just in case. So we're doing that rounds. And... Um, I finally speak to the doctor and he says, look, if we don't operate, your mum's uh, uh, liable to get, oh, she'd already had the one operation. Now they needed permission to operate again on her colon. And if she didn't, she would likely die. And But if it was unsuccessful, she was likely to have a stoma bag, uh, um, a colostomy bag. So I said, go ahead. Now, I've since learned the question to ask at that point to the doctor is, what would you do if it was your mum or dad? And they might answer differently, but they're bound by their hypocritic oath to say we can save. So, well, this will happen. So leaving the choice of me, I have no capacity to know to ha how to handle that. So I said, you better go ahead and operate. That She'd already had the edges of dementia. Now this triggered full-on dementia. I mean, we had the lawyers in the hospital doing more stuff that week. And... Um, so then we watched this sort of gradual decline and there was this, but I was remembering she had joked with me in the same way I said to Barney, roll me down the hill on the wheelchair. Yeah. Um, she had joked, she used to say, yeah, just let me go. Just, you know, it's okay. You know, I don't want the silly. She'd say it humor, hum, with humor. She'd say it with some, never with candor. Let, I just need to be clear with you, and this is what I want. She, it was always attached to, and she was martyrish. As, she could be martyrish right, as well as, a, as a, mm. a way of being. So I didn't really take much notice. And then one day we're sitting in the nursing home a couple of Christmases ago. We're sitting around to eat with her, and she has a plate of stew, and my son has no food because he'd eaten and wasn't hungry. She says, oh, you haven't eaten. She reaches into her plate with her bare hands, picks up this stew, which is dripping, and puts it on the table in front of him. Mm. That was just like, oh. And I looked up at her in that moment, and, oh, wow. <laughs> what have I done to you? You would not, this is not the you, you, yeah. you that you yeah. wanted. Yeah. And it was too late. You know, I can't then say, oh, excuse me, can we turn mum off now, right? Like, yeah. You can't do that. It's gone. But I... It's such a now. Is, how far away is that from suicide? Making that decision from someone else, right? Yeah. Oh, so, so you're here today. You're, I see you're here to talk about killing your mum, right? It's, it's obviously language is going to impact it, but I think that requires. This, I'm not telling anyone who tries to commit suicide, who tries to take their own life. I'm going to change my language. Yeah. Who tries to take their own life? Who is even contemplating, I'm not going to tell them it's the wrong thing to do or a bad thing to do. I'm yeah. really happy to have a conversation and help them in whatever way I can because I'm committed to that in my love of my fellow human being. But make them wrong, no way. No, you, you, you're just not. But it's painful. How do we support people to take the lives of other people when they need support to be able to t take that? Is it California where it's permissible? You can just take a no. pill or so it's not even there. No, Switzerland yeah, that, where you can go for, you know, the, the I, wanted to, I wanted to switch to that topic because I had, mm. uh, there's also a stigma attached to suicide. Mm. So as soon as the, the word suicide does come up, there's also a stigma. And I, and I was in contact with when my mom died, there was another woman who kind of became my mom and she also died two years after. So I was really struggling to hold on to a figure without the fear of losing it again. But there was another figure that came into my life and, and she was someone we spent many years together, but I guess it would have been seven years. She had cancer 
in California and she was deteriorating pretty quick. And she did not want to be whatever the euthanized or whatever the term would be, um, assisted suicide, because she said, I don't want the stigma of having suicide on my death certificate. Mm. And she, and, and, and in order not to have that, she wanted to fly to Switzerland because in Switzerland, that was one of the few places on the, on the planet where she could. So in terms of both of your lives, is there, you know, I know that for Bambos, we did this show and we're pretty vulnerable and we were out there and we didn't talk about that on our show until we were sort of a, pretty far into doing these things. So I'm wondering mm. for both of you, how does it feel? When you come out and say, yeah, I've tried to commit suicide, because even you, you know, just being this open about it, you know, that that also is not easy for people like the woman at the bakery when you said mom died yesterday. So how has it been from both of your sides on that topic? Mm. I, I think I referred to it when I said how the nurses treated me like it's a foolish act. My father and mother were pretty cross about the impact of it. Um, mm. I, I have no problem talk, talking about it, referring to it as part of my, when I'm introducing myself mm. in my work, I will include, it, especially when I'm going to coach someone, I want them to know that, they can visit anywhere with me and so i'll say and they're often surprised and grateful i spend about an hour on the first visit learning about them but letting them know about me a lot that's this my philosophy inside of the coaching that they can know that some therapists might say oh no they know nothing about you over here blah 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 yeah uh, but it's not my stuff um so no i don't i think back then probably remember we're talking uh, 90 oh, well over 25 years ago things have changed a little over time in society. Um, did I feel aber aber that aberration from other people? Did I feel people bit no. Um, amazing. I mostly experienced compassion. Hmm. I remember seeing David, who's the who's ironically whose son committed suicide. Uh, I remember going to see he was an older friend of ours in his fifties when we were in our thirties. And um I just walked out to his door and he just opened his door and he said, oh, come here, old boy, and put his arms around me. And it was about the most <laughs> other people have put their arms around me. There's something in David's being then, mm. which was the recognition you are in pain and just held me there. So I, I'm not sure I experienced too much disapproval from others mm. uh, to the degree that, well, I, uh, yeah, my mum, as I told you, had ta has taught us to be careful about what other people think. Fuck them if it's not. I'm not. I wouldn't be ashamed if it was on my thing. Uh, on my, I'd like it to say assisted or, yeah, um, yeah, helped on their way. But I wouldn't. Yeah. Anyway, why would I be embarrassed? I'm no longer here. It's, exactly. It's gonna, yeah. yeah but, so I'm trying to work that out actually for myself. But that's the degree yeah. to which our our identity holds us, isn't it? Of what will others think? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I think the danger is. If you think it through, it's like, what would that look like for Ellie? Who were you being that your husband committed suicide? Yeah. You yeah. must have been a bitch, right? That's, yeah. How was your parenting that your son, and we know, uh, you know, from the compassion I have from my darling friends who lost their daughter, and deliberately not naming them, as I'm not sure I have their permission. I, I, they'd probably tell me often, so you should have just said, don't be afraid of it. But um, I think... Um, yeah, I, I guess the last thing I, I don't think that thought like, oh, yeah. what did you? What was your parenting like? I mean, yeah, their daughter spent most of her teens, her early teens, the best friend of my son here in this house, and so um, they're wonderful parents. Yeah, so, yeah. It's you know what? You, you, it would, I had another question, but I do want to. I don't know where you are in terms. My boss of the, is going to answer. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I would say uh, I probably have more trouble saying that I. I haven't been vaccinated then i try to my god I... <laughs> <laughs> but, but but it's funny it, um it, it's not it doesn't come easy for me to say that i haven't been vaccinated and it's probably one of the first times i'm saying it online because mm. um I, I have clients that might not want to work with me again 
but I see there's a silence in me also because I don't I don't want to be one of these people that makes a statement and all of a sudden alienates people. Mm -hmm. But the suicide part, yeah, I, I think that's part of my journey. It's why I can hold space and why I I, I live so passionately and yeah. The the thing that I've seen, we've talked about the the first person experience of the suicide and then we sort of pointed at the the third person so the people around the individual and when i and when i did the last letter to her um i would do a lot of podcasts afterwards people were asking me to join podcasts and then one of the questions they'd always ask is what is the kind of thing that you learned from doing 60 sessions in the three months that I drove mm. through the US. Mm. And, and, and the answer was kind of, I think it surprised them and me because in being holding space for so many people, you start to see what's weighing on them because clearly when they're writing a last letter to someone as if it's the last letter they're gonna send them, there's that that's kind of, they're, they're digging deep to the, the heart of what's really intense for them. And the letters that were the hardest to hear were the ones written to the people who committed suicide. Mm. Because mm. what I saw in those, and it gets emotional for me because I don't really, I mean, I, I have to let the emotion in again, is that there's a helplessness in the people because they feel like there was something they could have done. And so to hear them even 20 or 30 years later, talk about what it is they weren't able to do, which is the reason that you committed suicide, because I believe if I had known more, I could have been there for you. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the most painful, or they were some of the most painful letters to hear, mm -hmm. because you just feel the immense unresolved pain that they've lived with for all those years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, well <laughs> I, I, I know that question is uh, fortunately for, uh, the, well, the one, the, the father of the son, he, he's got Alzheimer's. So he, he I'm not sure how present he was to yeah. the, to what had happened to his son for the other couple whom I saw about two weeks after I went camping with, uh, with, uh, the dad and, um, uh, uh I, I didn't experience, I think we sat and talked with them and had coffee and they talked to us about their experience of, you know, what they were going through. Of course, there's going to be, what else could I have done? When Colin killed himself, um, we'd been to see him about a fortnight earlier. And um, I, and again, I'm complete with what happened with Colin because I went to a playback theatre event where they asked for volunteers for an emotional experience they'd had and I put up my hand and, went through Colin's suicide so it made it easier for me right I, I dealt with it at the time but it, at the time he we'd seen him a fortnight earlier at a party he'd thro thrown at his house and he he was so excited he was on uh, bipolar at that point so he you know he, he just got gotten on a bad day um and oh with everything I know now I I'd love to turn back the, you talked about no regrets earlier if there's a point in time I could turn back the clock um, one of the things I do in my coaching to all my clients, these are commercial, you know, these are corporate clients or wherever I coach, I say to them, I'm available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they look at me as to say, and they sort of pass it off. And I go, no, I don't think you've got what I said. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because I'm this relationship is of one human being to another. And you call me if you wake in the middle of the night, if something has happened. Now, the in the 20 years of coaching, but probably when I really took that on for myself, it's about the last 10 years, I have had two, three people who've called me at unusual times to deal with something. One of them was, I hate my fucking chairman, right? But that's, you know, it wasn't, but the other two were were, were calling out for something was going on. Yeah. And, um, I, what Colin gave me was that awareness to be aware at all times of a cry for help, if you could see and hear it. Now we have to yeah. persuade people to, sh to shout loud enough, right, and not to yeah. be embarrassed by it. And then that, 
takes us right back to the stigma that they're going to feel and what it does to our loved ones. And we're, we're back in the whole loop. We got it, we've got it fucked up in our heads at the moment until we can begin to address it. So it's great to be having this forum, you know, this conversation yeah. about it to let even people think, how do we tackle it? Not, don't know if that answered your question exactly. It may have sounded like a. I, I like um, the answer. I don't know where, well, my question was no, in the meantime. No. The, but, the one thing I noticed is not this, that dissimilar from you. I, I keep, I always say six clients, like I, for the very same reason, because I do say is that I am building a relationship with you in this journey. And I don't know where that journey is going to go. It might be for a week. I need to talk to you every single day. Exactly. We might not speak mm -hmm. together for another month, but like when that time is necessary, it's necessary. It's not, a, it's not office hours. You know, we're mm -hmm. not going to talk. Sometimes, of course, you need maintenance, but um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I know very well the feeling of I'm going to have fewer people in my life. But when we go on the journey, we're on that journey. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it what happened <laughs> bizarrely in that conversation, one of my clients called me. I was going down Fleet Street heading to his offices and he called me up and said, I need to cancel today. And I go, OK, why would you need to cancel? He said, well, he's got this report to write and explained everything. And, and then. I said, well, okay, I'm literally like less than 10 minutes away. I'm coming. Let's spend, let's just deconstruct what you just told me about, which was this report he needed to do. And we got to the bottom, we got to the bottom of it, but the report still needed doing. So I said, do the report and call me in the morning and we can discuss how you don't get yourself into this situation. Mm -hmm. Way more complex than make it sound. Mm -hmm. Anyway, next morning he calls me to say his sister-in-law committed suicide last night. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and you know, he's now dealing with that. Oh, and there was something going on with his house, right? And so um, that he'd been dealing with. And I sort of that put it all in perspective. And he, he, well, he said that to me, like we we agreed on that. And then I said, you know, I'm here if you if you or your family want help. And he's like, yeah, thanks. And then I said, stop. Did you hear what I said? We yeah. are here. That's me and Ellie, and we we're, whatever it takes. And then he called the next day. Said my brother and his family would really like your help so we gave wow. them the help and that wasn't as a construct and his, his boss came back to us and said wanted to meet us because of, because of that event later on uh, but you see uh we wanted to make sure the kids don't didn't go down that route and the the, the father didn't end up you know a chain of events again bringing it out let people talk it out but it's not we're not always prepared to listen or hear it and Mm. We can't, you know, we are all responsible for ourselves. So the, the thing I learned from my attempt, when I finally, they got me to see a, a, um, a, a, a counselor and I journal a lot. Now it all happens on my iPad with good notes, but in the, you know, mostly I'll write in journals and they're all down here. And I had kept journals and I sat down with this therapist and there was a pit, I'd drawn this picture of a dragon coming out of a smoking cauldron. And she looked at it, she was dressed in a tweed jacket and she went, hmm, that's very phallic. And I was so cross, right? I was so like, oh, she's like Jung or Freud or something. And I just got up and walked out. I said, I'm sorry, I can't work with you. I didn't know what I needed. Then, second time we go i go to a cranial sacred a sacral therapist who were and but he's also did their uh, psychotherapy training he was at the karuna institute up on dartmoor he was amazing first time with him he's holding my head and i fall asleep on the couch and he's waking me up and i'm going oh, i'm sorry i fell asleep he said don't be sorry you needed to sleep it's okay to sleep here so that was great loved him next session then he had a heart attack and died now I'm like, nobody can help me. The therapist just can't help me. No one's ever going to be able to help me. That's when the despair kicked in. So that was mm -hmm. pre the argument with Ellie. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, I go and see this uh, clinical psychiatrist at late years later, right? And he says to me, well, tell me your story. And I told him my story and he went, wow. He said, it's like you're on the crest of an adrenaline wave. And I said, I have no idea what that means. And he said, what I mean is that you've had highs and lows and it sounds like you didn't know how to deal with this one it sounds like all the other times you got into action you you, you went to the edge and i said wow and i looked all embarrassed he said what's the matter i said well you'll think i'm crazy now talk about great therapy he just said leant forward and he went don't worry all my patients are crazy <laughs>
<laughs> so, I, so I, I go, oh, okay. And he said, no, but I'm especially crazy. He said, okay, what makes you especially crazy? And I said, I can't tell you. He said, of course you can tell me. It's okay. Just, you know, what, what is it? And I said, well, I heard a voice. And he went, well, <laughs> that's not crazy. We all hear voices, right? Yeah. That's us. He said, but I'm more interested in what the voice had to say. And for the first time I looked, I looked back at that time at what had caused that reaction in me. And it was that I didn't have to do this anymore. That was the statement. That was the car crash. Mm. That was like 1990 when I had the car crash. The voice had gone, you know, and it gave up. It gave up, right? It mm. wanted to give up. Last time I'd changed jobs, changed careers, changed countries. This time it didn't know what to do. So he said, well, okay, your job is go and find out what it means to be responsible. I went, how do I do that? And he said, well, there's the start of it. Start, yeah, do some work on it. And I called up the DVLA, Driving Vehicle License Authority, to find out. I don't know why this occurred to me, to find out the nature of response. I mean, weeks I was ringing, as you had to in those days. wasn't they're all computerized. I finally got through to their chief counsel. He said, what do you want? People keep telling me you're calling me. I've decided to take your call. And I said, well... I'm not sure if you can help me. And I said, look, this is what he said. Oh, if it's about your accident, talk to your insurance company. And I said, no, no, I'm just trying to find out who's responsible for the accident. He said, well, were you hit? And I go, yeah. And he said, well, it's there for I said, no, it's not what I mean. I'm in this journey to try and find out the nature of responsibility. And he goes, why are you calling me? And I go, well, I don't know. It just figured that it was a car accident. <laughs> anyway, he paused and he went, oh, okay. Well, the one thing I can tell you is this. When you got your driving license, you, do you remember signing it? And I go, yeah. He said, that signature said, you're talking to me, the chief counsel, that you will be responsible. You'll insure your car, you'll MOT your car, the Ministry of Transport um, it, it, um, thing, and then that you'll, be, you'll buy insurance. You'll be responsible for yourself. You're absolving me and the government of responsibility. That's why you insure yourself. Uh, wow. I said, does that mean I was... To blame, well, don't use the word blame because in others' insurance, if you ever say that. But yeah, I think you're responsible. You did you get in the car that day? And I went, yeah. And he said, what? He said, therefore, you were responsible for your accident. So, oh, the feeling of being a victim is if you'd met me previously, I'd have gone, oh, I had this accident. You should feel sorry for me. Or mm. it, it all disappeared in that moment. It was like, I, oh, I'm the responsible for my life. Now, mm. to put a different perspective back on the suicide, I was still being responsible for myself, maybe, right? Not in the way that our conventional society says, but I learned in that moment to be responsible. You can't blame, it's not, and it's not right, or, uh, when our hearts says that, it's not good, bad, right, wrong, not yeah. blame. It's just, just being caused in the matter. So I learned to be caused in the matter. Now that's helpful. But sometimes I feel that is a despair. I go, oh, God, I'm at the center of this. And, and maybe suicide would be the easy way out, right, to get yeah. away from being responsible. And, yeah. and so it goes on. Yeah, we're back in mm -hmm. the loop. Back in the loop. We have a lot of comments that came in, but since we were so engaged, we didn't get in those today. But at well, least it would be nice to, to bring some of them on just to let the mm. people know that we are checking them out. Mm. Heidi Haynes, I've landed in an institution twice with suicidal thinking. Albeit both times I talked myself out in, in one day. My mm. dad actually went to a psychiatric ward and then he said, when I was there, I realized I wasn't crazy, <laughs> um, which is quite funny. Yeah, I've heard that before, that experience from people. Yeah, Bola Lung says, I once paid someone a surprise visit only to find out that they'd overdosed on tablets and left a note. I rushed him to the hospital and he survived then. Later he succeeded. I felt like I wasted his time by interrupting it the first time. Oh, isn't uh, that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like Heidi Haynes' next comment. Yeah. Um, that one. Well, that's oh, Heidi said, uh, Bola Lang, by not and by and by not acting, I think you'd have been putting yourself in a mental prison of doubt for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah. And then uh, your humanity is not something that you want to doubt. Hmm. And she finally leaves by mm. saying, uh, Ian, I'm proud to know and love you. Uh, uh, thank you, Heidi. Hi. <laughs> that's so a, I think also a British joke, Heidi. Hi. So that's another story. <laughs> 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 well, we'll leave with the Ian Hale. Uh, 
Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, mm. especially now, given everything that is going on in your life. Mm. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to open my heart and mind with you. I have great respect for the pair of you and enjoy listening when I've listened. And um, you know, Andy, that Ellie and I you know, we went on these trips and we had your audio book playing with the, the last letter. So it's lovely. Yeah. You know, you know, that's, uh, yeah. I'd like to leave one final thought about you know, death and dying and everything. It's like the, the access to all of it is being complete. I had this complete with my mum and with my dad just before he died. We had a conversation. And I know that's what the letter encourages us, the last letter encourages us to do, to put that to bed. So I'm a great respecter of that experience. And yeah. and boss, your vulnerability and questioning and courage and sharing yourself, the pair of you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Love you, Ian. Have a beautiful Love day. Love you, Ian. Yeah, you yeah, too. Have Thank a nice you. weekend, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to rest now. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. That's about all you can do, I imagine. <laughs> Bye. It is. Bye. Bye. Hmm. How was it for you to get through that one? Hmm. Just that. Yeah. Got through it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's it. That's it. We see you Monday. Till then. Bye bye.